Thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. It's great to be here with you, Leopoldo. It's an honor. Um, it's been incredible for me to watch these two communities that I've gotten to know over the last 15 years get closer and closer together, the human rights community, the global freedom community, and the Bitcoin community. So today's kind of like a, kind of a culmination of that moment in many ways. Um, before we get into your story, Leopoldo, your amazing struggle and your story, um, let's talk a little bit about your country. Um, and you told me something before we came on stage that shocked me. Um, and again, I'm someone who's supposed to be an expert in this field. Something that the United Nations came out with two days ago, a new conclusion. Do you, do you want to tell the audience about this, this conclusion? Well, thank you, Alex, and, and thanks to all of you. So I was telling Alex this morning that just yesterday, the UN presented a report about migration and refugees in the world. And Venezuela became the first country with a migration crisis. 7.1 million Venezuelans are now living outside our country. That's 25% of the population. That's above Ukraine, that is on the 6 million, and that's above Syria. However, Venezuela has not had a war like Ukraine and Syria. So without a war, without a foreign occupation, there are more Venezuelan refugees than refugees from any other country in the world. This is just sort of shocking. And how did we get here is part of the story we're going to get to today, uh, part of the chronology. I mean, this country used to be a success story. I mean, Venezuela was one of the richest nations in South America, and it was a place where people would flee from other dictatorships to re seek refuge in Venezuela in the 70s and the 80s. Um, so today is, you know, uh, focusing on, on, on your story, but we're also telling the story of how exactly did this society crumble uh, so badly. So with that, we'll, we'll get into the, into the slideshow. And um, we start with your early career. Um, so tell us about, uh, you know, the mid-2000s in Venezuela. You know, why did you get into politics and, and how did you find yourself a, a, as mayor of one of the largest... Uh, the cities in the country? Well, at the time of the turn of the century, Chavez was elected. There was a time of change, and uh, we ran for office. We won. Uh, I was the underdog candidate at the time. I was very, very young. I was 26. Mm -hmm. We won, uh, and I was mayor for two terms. However... Uh, so when you were 26, you became mayor, and how large was this uh, district that you were... In charge of? Well, it's at the heart of Caracas. It's at the center of the capital. It had um, 150,000 people at mm -hmm. the time. Uh, but it was at the heart of Caracas, so everybody had to go through the municipality. Mm -hmm. And we focused in doing things right, doing things transparently. We won international prizes for being the most transparent municipality in, in Venezuela. Um, we did a lot with... Um, all of the urban planning, we build schools, we build um, healthcare um, facilities, we build parks, plazas, and we actually did something very important, is that we became sustainable financially. We got together and realized that doing taxing in the right way, with the right incentives, will give us more possibilities of doing uh, more for the people. So we were very, very successful uh, at the time. That was between the year 2000 and the year 2008. And you were very popular, and you became one of the most popular political figures in the country. So this is uh, uh, some data from a poll that was taken um, about 14 years ago in Venezuela. Do you just want to explain for the audience what this is what Well, this that's, is a, that's a, a, it's a, a screenshot of what was the, um, the popularity during, 19, during 2008. 2008. 2008. Yeah. Uh, that was the end of my term. And when I saw this, me and my team, we said, well, this is good, but this blessing, it's going to become a curse. But, but just to be clear, like, uh, well, you know, it's showing that on the left sh that there's people who, who know you and on the right people who who favor you, who think, yes. who think highly of you, right? Yes, and so, so the green columns are uh, the level of people's uh, support. So at the time, Hugo Chavez was president, uh, and this is a poll taken in Caracas. So at the time, uh, I had more support than Hugo Chavez at uh, Caracas. But that was, as I said before, it could have been a blessing, but it became a curse because 
after this became evident, I was disqualified to run for office. And what, did they, what kind of reasons did they use to disqualify you? Well, they created a case against me uh, because I paid the medical doctors, the police, and the firemen. I did what day-to-day -day mayors do, which is to figure out how, within the budget, you can, you can cover the requirements. Very clear, very transparent. But they opened a case, and they decided to disqualify me to run for office. So you could not run for presidency? Well, I was running for higher office. I was running at the time to become the metropolitan mayor, which is the governor of the entire city. I had more than 60%, 65% of support. Uh, there was no way we were going to lose that election. And I, I use we in plural because we were a big team. Yeah. We had uh, people that were dedicated to different areas, and we were very committed to change our city. So your disqualification led to uh, f a four- to five-year period of time where Venezuela became increasingly draconian. And people in the West you know, supported Chavez for many reasons, They thought he was standing up to the U.S. They thought that he was uh, pow a powerful person for the people. There were all these kind of um, narratives that people really believed in in the West. Um, and these started to start to come un untied. They started to start, start to collapse as he started to do things like outlaw independent media, stack the government with his cronies, um, that the corruption became more evident, that this country that has the largest petroleum reserves on the planet Um, failed to meet the most basic needs of its people. So, you know, people started to rise up, um, especially after he died and, and his, his, the, the person he appointed to take over, Maduro, became kind of like an obvious autocrat. So you were at the heart of these protests, and this is a, a very famous image taken of you. Do you want to give some context as to why were people upset and, and what were you guys doing out there in the streets? Well, some context. Venezuela today is... Uh dictatorship. Yes. Uh, it's recognized as such, even by Maduro and, and his people. But it was not always that way. It was a gradual process uh, by which, as you said, the independent media was killed, then the judiciary was killed, then um, the possibilities of uh, freedom of speech uh, were uh, strangled. Mm -hmm. So it was a process. The it labor was unions. Gradual. Um, I was disqualified in the year 2008, mm -hmm. and then we decided to put together a civil resistance movement. And we built a movement all throughout the country, and uh, that took me to the end of 2013, when we became the movement that won the largest number of mayors uh, in an election that happened. And in January of 2014, we called for massive protests. And those protests were... Uh, supported by tens of thousands of people, not just in Caracas, but all over Venezuela. And February the 12th, we were protesting, and two people were killed next to me, and the dictatorship blamed killed me by immediately. Killed by guns or batons, or how were they killed? They were killed uh, by gunshots, by the detail of the uh, Minister of Interior. Mm -hmm. And that became evidently clear um, during the investigations that followed. So that was... February the 12th, um, a warrant for my arrest came out, so I had to go into hiding, but I decided to present myself voluntarily to, as Martin Luther King said, to show the scars of the system in order for change to happen. So on February the 18th of um, 2014, that's uh, when these pictures were taken, I presented myself voluntarily, it was tens of thousands of people in the street, and that took me to prison. So I spent the next four years in uh, military prison, most of the time in solitary confinement, and most of the time um, fighting from, from silence. But fortunately, my wife Lillian, who's with me today, was my voice and the voice of the political prisoners. She was able to take our case, not just to the Venezuelan people, but beyond. And so... <clears throat> Um, I mean, that's like a, an eternity for some people to contemplate. I mean, can you describe a little bit the detail of the prison, the cell that you were in? How big was it? What kind of, you know, things were offered to you during the day? Just give us a sense of what it was like. Well, that, that, that picture is a picture uh, during my first year. Uh, and then things got gradually uh, worse. I, most of the time I was in a 
two and a half by two meter uh, cell. Um, I didn't have access to electricity, so for 12 hours of every day I was in complete darkness. I didn't have access to running water. I was most of the time in solitary confinement. And um, it, was, it was difficult, but I had read a lot before going to prison about people's experience in prison. And the reason why I read a lot about this was because months before I was uh, taken into prison, there was another warrant for my arrest that they took out. So I knew that that was a very high probability that I was going to end up in prison. And the most important thing that I got from reading... Uh, Gandhi, Landela, Luther King, uh, Venezuelan political prisoners and others was routine. You have to have a routine when you're in prison. So that was uh, a cell that I had. And um, I had uh, this, this, this bird that, uh, that was with me for a couple of, uh, of weeks. And, uh, and it was very significant because I had a small window and that bird was, uh, was right in, in front of me. Um, they allowed me to have it, um, but then they, they took it away. So it came and visited you? Yeah. And it was just... No, actually, the, 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 bird was just, uh, the story was that the bird went to get uh, a chicken and then it, it collapsed with a fence. And since I was always talking about that bird, about that hawk, uh, the guard said, you know, you can, you, know, you, can, you can have it. So they had it for a couple of weeks and that was uh, mm, the, the least solitary moment <laughs> I had in prison. And um, can you talk to us about, like, I mean, you know, most people, you were there for in and out for, for many, many years, for seven years. Um, most people kind of would lose their mind. So, you know, you had to keep your mind fit, your body fit. Like, what are, what are some of the things that you did to, to make sure that you didn't lose it? Well, as I was telling you, the most important thing for me was having a routine. And uh, for me, that routine was very simple. It was about um, mind, soul, and body. Mm -hmm. So I would pray every day. Uh, I'm a Catholic, but like many Catholics, a mechanical Catholic, you know, I was mm. baptized, I did my first communion, uh, but fortunately, I had that in my background, so when I went into prison, I was able to take a hold of, of that spiritual link. Uh, I would try to exercise my intellect in whatever way. I would read, write, draw, try to play an instrument, but you then they took the books away, uh, and I did exercise uh, every day. So I did those three things every day. And you managed to, to write something from within prison, right? Actually, I wrote two books. I wrote a book about my experience, and I wrote a book about energy policy for Venezuela. But it was uh, the, both of them, I had to write them in moments where I was able to take my writings uh, out. So the first book, I wrote it while I was being um, in, in my process. Uh, I was sentenced to 14 years in prison, so it was a long process. So I would take my writing and give it to my lawyer, and then uh, my sister helped with the publishing. And the other book, I would write in very, very small pieces of paper, uh, and then I would take it out, I would give it to my wife. She would take it in a piece of gum, and uh, for months... She would send it to a friend of mine who was writing this book with me, and that's how I wrote the second book. You, you said that um, yeah, it's, it's an amazing, uh, amazing thing of persistence. You said that um, Lillian became your voice. Do you want to talk a little bit about what was happening outside prison during these years uh, and what she was doing around the world to raise um, your profile and to get organizations like Amnesty International to consider you a political prisoner? Well, Lillian, my wife, is, uh, she's a school teacher by training, but she was very involved in uh, extreme sports. She was Venezuela national champ for kite surfing, uh, and uh, she was not involved in politics, but she's uh, an extreme sports person. So when I went to prison, we spoke and said, you know, this is the extremist of the extreme sport. So we assumed you know, what we were going through with that type of attitude. So Lillian um, went not just around Venezuela, but around the world, mm -hmm. talking about what was happening, not just to me, but also to other political prisoners. So she became, in a way, the voice of freedom uh, of the Venezuelan people at the time. And she was very successful to bring advocacy to the cause of freedom in Venezuela. I, I always thought that this was an interesting little parable, but um, it, it helps people understand maybe what, what, what kind of society Venezuela was at the time and still is. Um, around the same time as, as some of these protests that broke out that, that you were a part of, we had protests in, in, in America, in my country as well, that were called Occupy Wall Street. Um, 
But something like 90, 95% of people who were detained were like immediately released, okay? And, and they weren't charged with anything. The protests in Venezuela were very different. Um, a, a very large percentage of people who protested not only were detained, but they've never even been heard from again or have disappeared. I mean, this to me really underlines the, the, the difference between like a fear and a, and a free society. You know? Oh, for sure. I, so just from my political party or movement, we had more than 500 detainees, more than 100 political prisoners. I have friends, very close friends that were with me the, the, my last day of freedom that were killed, uh, that were executed with two gunshots in the back of their heads. Then they were uh, thrown to the streets, gasoline thrown over their bodies, and then their bodies were lit. Um, so this is the type of violence that we face in Venezuela. Um, I still have some very close friends who are in prison uh, today, uh, people that have been in prison for 25 years. Uh, that is happening today in Venezuela. There are more than 400 political prisoners uh, in, in our country, men, women, uh, civilians, people from the military. So the way in which, and this is what Mandela said, the way in which a regime treats their prisoners um, is the way in which you can tell they will treat their citizens. Now, uh, during this time when um, you were in prison, Lillian was, was out there being your voice, uh, something else was happening. The Venezuelan economy was completely collapsing and the Bolivar, the, the currency, uh, was disintegrating. It was hyperinflating. H how does the world's largest petroleum, uh, you know, you know, location um, and such a vibrant and rich economy that, that used to be, again, one of the, one of the like, economic success stories of the region. H how does it collapse so violently and so badly? I mean, can you, can you shed a little light into that and talk a little bit about, about what hyperinflation did to Venezuela? Well, you, the, the, the important thing is to understand where we came from. Venezuela yeah. is today the, the country where the largest resource of oil are. Um, we were producing 3.7 million barrels per, of oil in the year 2000. Today we're producing 500,000. Uh, and, and what happened was a huge mismanagement and corruption of the economy. However, we had, again, a blessing that became a curse, and that was high oil prices. So in the year 2004, there was a spike of oil prices that went from 15 uh, and uh, reached 100 and even beyond, and that uh, period of high prices was sustained for 10 years. And that was a mirage of a good model. And I was very surprised to listen to analysts in the U.S. and Europe talking about the miracle of Venezuela as a, a, as a project to follow when it was really uh, just the, the use of high prices, but the capacity of the economy was crumbling. And, so and Chavez was like doing a lot of handouts with this money. Yes, like. yes. But a lot of it went out in corruption. A yeah. lot of it went out in just uh, plain mismanagement. So year 2014, when the prices collapsed, we went from a period of, of prosperity to a humanitarian crisis in almost uh, no time. But it, it was very clear what was going to happen because the system that was imposed by Chavez and then by Maduro was a system that was against um, the, the, the market economy. It was a centralized economy. It was very, very corrupt. So it was very clear where we were going. It, it is hard for people to imagine um, the, 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 the reality of a currency that... that is so um, volatile that, that it, it can change even in an hour or two hours or three hours, the, the, the exchange rate. Um, I have a colleague who's Venezuelan, and she told me that, um, you know, she worked for several years at a re reasonably high-paying job, and the total amount of money in Bolivars that she made during that time is now worth less than one U.S. dollar. And, you know, obviously, this really impacts the poor and the middle classes the most. I mean, the wealthy find ways... To, to, to secure their value, right? They can get access to different things. They can even borrow in Bolivars and buy property and then pay back the loan when it disintegrates. But for the great majority of people, it led to a tremendous suffering. Here's just some data on, you know, the fact that over this time period that you're describing, um, the uh, basic, basic foodstuffs that people require 
uh, plummeted and, and people started replacing proteins with, with vegetables. I mean, this is a social collapse, essentially. Well, it is what, what, what the technical name is, uh, complex humanitarian crisis. Uh, and that means that basically the entire society is collapsing. The hospitals have collapsed, the, no access to electricity, no access to running water. Um, almost half of uh, the population doesn't eat three times a day. There is two-thirds of the children in Venezuela have problems of malnutrition. So, I mean, it's, it's not just one problem. It's that the, it's sustained and it's spread all over uh, the society. And again, uh, think about this. 7.1 million people, that's 25% of our population, have left our country looking for opportunities, looking for security, looking for education, looking for health, um, without a war. I mean, similar number in Ukraine, similar number but lower in Syria with a war. In the case of Venezuela, it was a war of the system against the people. It was the system, the mismanagement, and the corruption against the people. And that's what has led to uh, this humanitarian crisis that we have, that the root cause is a political model. The root cause is a, an autocratic regime. So that's why we are committed to produce political change in Venezuela, because there is no way we can solve the problems of the Venezuelan people if there is no freedom and democracy for the Venezuelan people. Did, did, I mean, you know, when you talk about like the regime itself, obviously you have a hyperinflation that's so bad that the currency itself becomes almost useless and people start doing, you know, art and various things with it because it's, it's not, not useful as a money anymore. Um, but the regime still lives pretty large, right? I mean, there's still a lot of spending among the, 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 the military and the drug trade they have and you know, do you want to talk a little bit about this dichotomy? Well, so the Venezuelan GDP has collapsed in by 80%. I mean, this is something uncomparable to any other... 80%. 80% of the GDP of Venezuela has collapsed. That means that the Venezuelan economy today is 20% what it was eight years ago. That's astonishing. That, that's non-comparable to the collapse of the economy of Europe during World War II. That's non-comparable to any other uh, collapse. So and, that, there's, and there's direct data, by the way, that any, any, for every 1% of GDP loss that a country has, you know, a, a certain very large number of people die, basically. So, I mean, we're talking about a, an enormous amount of people who've fled and who've died as a result of this. Yes, and, and, and this is what we are seeing every day. These are Venezuelans crossing to Colombia, and we are seeing rivers of people leaving our country uh, every day, as I said before, looking for opportunities, looking for health, looking for education, looking for security. And, uh, and, and just put the other one, the next one, just the next one. It's not, so this, is, uh, this was front page New York Times last Sunday. So these are Venezuelans that are crossing the Darien jungle from Panama to Colombia. And they risk their lives. 5% of the people that take the chance of crossing this jungle die. So we are talking about a deathly um, threat that people know that, is, that they are facing. And I have talked to many of these Venezuelans that have crossed, and they've uh, gone all the way to the United States. And I asked them why you took the risk. And I said, I'd rather take that risk 1,000 times than stay in Venezuela. I'd rather face the uncertainty of the jungle, the uncertainty of getting in or not to the United States, than the certainty of staying in Venezuela without access to food, to water, to health care, and to education. Yeah, so, I mean, we have a situation where corruption and hyperinflation have led to, again, the largest refugee crisis in the world. And, you know, during this time, there were a lot of governments and institutions that wanted to help Venezuelans. They wanted to send aid in. Uh, but the Maduro regime like, did not want the aid in coming in for different reasons. They didn't want it supporting certain people. So they like, blockaded aid in, in a very physical way many, many times. Yeah, and, that's and it, the border between Venezuela and Colombia. And Maduro decided to close the border between Venezuela and Colombia in order for aid and support not to go through. But what's interesting, and, and this is where we're going to kind of spend the last few minutes of our talk discussing is what you don't see on this image is, are the millions of dollars of Bitcoin moving back and forth. And, 
you know, what ended up happening, obviously, the country is now dollarizing, right? People, when it comes to fiat currency, they don't want the Bolivar anymore. Merchants want dollars. Like, dollars are becoming the, the lifeblood of the nation in many ways, like Cuba in the early 1990s. But people have also found Bitcoin and stable coins to be a very useful tool um, because it cannot be stopped by governments and it can't be stopped by the regime. Um, so you've, you've been digging into this a little bit since you got out uh, of uh, 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 prison. Um, you know, talk to us a little bit about uh, what, what you saw with the experiment that you ran with stablecoins with, with RTM and, the, and what kind of potential you see for, for technologies like Bitcoin to help people in Venezuela. So in the year uh, 2019, um, the president of the National Assembly was recognized as the interim president of Venezuela and that gave the, uh, an important status uh, in order to have the, the possibility to do things for Venezuelan people. So uh, 2020, with the COVID, we had the idea of using some of the funds that were seized to the dictatorship to support medical doctors and nurses. So what we did is, taking part of those funds, we worked uh, with the U.S. Treasury and OFAC because we needed the support from those institutions that were the, the that they had the oversight of this uh, of these funds in order to get them directly to Venezuela. So we used uh, what was available at the time. We created uh, an account for 80,000, almost 80,000 medical doctors and nurses to um, register and in order to receive a cash transfer. So we were able to get the, the, to almost 80,000 people a direct support through a mechanism that had absolutely no contact with the financial system of the dictatorship. Because we had seen, we had experienced, and this is something that it was very close to, or day to day, how the dictatorship closed NGOs, how they imprisoned our people, how they identify through the banking system the people that were yeah. working against the dictatorship and they went against it's, not just the, the account holder, but the people with the account. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's incredibly important to note that the regime completely controls the banking apparatus in the country, um, but they don't control permission, permissionless financial technology. So, you know, any Venezuelan at the time could download an RTM wallet and receive value from anyone in the United States. And there was really nothing the regime could do about it. And this is borne out in the data. I mean, what you're seeing here is that Venezuelans are, you know, because it's, it's, it's kind of like, uh, again, this difficult situation where the, 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 the money has died and has broken. Venezuelans are some of the people in the world who use Bitcoin and cryptocurrency the most per capita uh, of any country in the world. Um, so, I mean, what, what are your thoughts moving forward about wh where we go from here and, you know, how can the Bitcoin community get involved and help? Well, uh, I, I think for many people, using Bitcoin is... Uh, maybe a, a luxury or uh, a decision among choices that they have. Yes. Uh, in places like Venezuela, but in many other places in the world, we're talking about the largest part of the world's population that are unbanked, that don't have access to any other alternative. This is an alternative that they can use in order to um, provide uh, a possibility to get access to funding, uh, to do transfers, and to be banked, in a way. Yeah, so, so just, just for your data, for some statistics, 4.3 billion people live under an authoritarian regime that can just arbitrarily turn off your money, and nearly 2 billion people are, are, are unbanked. So we're talking about, you know, the lion's share of humans on this planet that, that don't have the same kind of financial freedoms you, that we enjoy. I mean, 2 billion people live under double-digit inflation at this point. So, again, we're talking, like, the 1 billion people who live in Europe, the United States and Japan, let's say, who have relatively stable, at least for now, currencies um, and, like, robust financial infrastructure, we are the minority. We're like the bubble. But, like, most people in the world live in a society where either because their government is, is autocratic and... Um, repressive, or because they're just living in a society that's, that doesn't have the same kind of capabilities and is poorer, or because they're cut off for some reason from the international financial system through sanctions or whatever. But that's, that's the situation of the average person here. 
Um, so I think we need to be mindful of that. And this is something you've even experienced yourself now in Europe. You were telling me that you know, some of your personal bank accounts have been frozen and shut off without any explanation. Yeah, and you're I like mean, a very I, prominent I, person. And that's a, that's a day-to-day reality for any Venezuelan. Just because of being a Venezuelan, you get your account uh, closed. And, uh, and that is something that we all face. So we see the value in, in what's happening. But my message here is that I hope that this community sees beyond the United States, beyond Europe, beyond the, the, the market where this is happening and this is kind of where uh, the innovations are happen up until now. Look to Africa, look to Latin America, look to Southeast Asia, look to Eastern Europe. That's where this is not a luxury. It's a need. It's vital. You either use an alternative uh, to fiat money uh, or you just don't have the possibility to do any transactions. So I, I think that it's very important to talk about, because I've heard a lot of the discussions in this conference and in others talking about financial freedom. And I know that many of the people that support Bitcoin do it for philosophical reasons. And, uh, and the philosophical reasons that have to do with the promotion and the defense of financial freedom. What our fight is about, it's about political freedom. That's what we fight for. We are fighting against an autocracy. We're fighting against uh, a dictatorship. We're fighting for a free and fair election in our country, for the respect of human rights, for the rule of law. That's our fight. But I am convinced that there is a convergence between financial freedom and political freedom. And in that convergence, I think that there needs to be a lot of attention. What things can be done in order to promote financial freedom uh, that can as well promote political freedom? And last thing I'll say before we get off stage is you told me something quite powerful. This relates to... Something I want you all to take home is this idea of Bitcoin as a humanitarian lifeline. You said that when, you know, the average $100 gets donated or, or sent to Venezuela from a place like the United States, what percentage of it actually makes it to the person on the other side? Well, so this is the way it works. Most aid that gets uh, transferred to places where there are crises, um, this is what happens to every dollar. 40 cents of the dollar, on average, stays either in Washington or in Brussels, or, or the equivalent. Then 20 cents of the dollar stay in a local NGO. And then 40 cents of the dollar go to the final aid project. However, with this project that we presented, that we were giving direct support to medical doctors and nurses, 97 cents of every dollar were going to an end beneficiary. And that was only possible because of the technology. Yeah. That was so only possible it, because it, it's... it was not linked to the financial system. And I think that's where many of you should start thinking uh, of opportunities. Again, look to Africa, look to Latin America, look to Southeast Asia. That's where the growth of the technologies that you are all promoting and thinking about are going to grow exponentially because it's vital. It's either that or people don't have it. Yeah, I mean, it's a matter of life and death in many cases. So if your dollar is only going to get 40 cents to the person you want to help, with Bitcoin, the whole dollar can go. And, you know, I would say Bitcoin fixes this. So thank you all very much. It's been such an honor to have you, no, Leopoldo. Thank you. We'll thank talk to you. you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Magazine Analyst Desk, brought to you by Bitco. We are live at day two of Bitcoin Amsterdam, and I'm joined by David Zell and C.K. Snarks. Gentlemen, we just heard from a rising political candidate out of Venezuela who had his legs essentially taken from him as he was rising up by the current regime. Then the current regime, as they continued to maintain power, drove that country down. David, can you walk us through exactly what happened in Venezuela? Well, I think the most important thing that happened in Venezuela is we saw in real time the failing experiment of modern monetary theory. Hyperinflation destroyed the country. We heard Alex talk about how Venezuela used to be one of the gems of South America, one of the most vibrant, wealthy economies there was. And to see degenerate fiat economics destroy that society, it's heartbreaking. But it's also inspiring to hear about how Bitcoin can be a solution for the countries that experience rapid monetary debasement from degenerate, harebrained economic policy. 
I stand by the fact that Westerners will be late to Bitcoin strictly from the fact that they haven't already felt this pain. We have not, until maybe this year, in recent memory, felt the fi you know, had the hand to the stove of inflation and poor monetary management. But the global south, that's all they know. So that plus totalitarianism, it, it breeds the it breeds the uh, the environments that Lewis was in. So it, it's yeah. I, I feel for them, but I do think that Bitcoin is hope. Uh, absolutely. I mean, look, very well said. I know we're going back to the next panel right now, guys. Be sure to like and subscribe down below. And we'll be back after this.